Thank you for inviting me here again, um, uh, Sawadika. And I'm very always very happy to be back in, in Thailand, um, a country that I always love to come to as well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the organizing committee and the team of people hosting this successful third time again. Um, we were here the first time. I missed the second time, but this is the third time you're hosting it, and I think um, this is a very successful event. Now, I know you're very tired over a long morning, and you're probably a little bit sleepy as well. So, um, before I go into the slides and my, my presentation, um, we, we hear a lot about what to do for emergency when you have disasters like thunderstorms, tsunami, earthquake, and, and things like that that you will happen, particularly fire as well. Um, in my own country, I'm from Malaysia, for those who doesn't know me yet, um, we also have fire in the hospital. And fire in the hospital has actually um, cost the patient's life as well. It's all in the newspaper as well. So emergency preparedness becomes very important. But I will not dwell into that detail today uh, because a lot of the presenters has mentioned um, wonderful things to do. And I'm sure you guys are working on developing those preparedness plans as well. Uh, but these are also very important things that I wanted to share. And hopefully from this perspective, before the fire happens, before the surgical fire happens, before any of these risks could happen in your hospital, other than the disasters itself, what could you do best as well? Um, I'm going to start my presentation with a video. My presentation will focus on how safety is so important other than during the emergency period of time and uh, how we should, from our different roles, basically I am not a biomedical engineer, but I am from the hospital management background and from all of us from the different role in healthcare, how could we actually contribute better to ensure that um, safety becomes a priority in the hospital, to ensure that ourselves, patients, staffs are safer in the hospital itself. So um, let me begin with a video and um, this video, I've been using it for many times. Some of you may have seen it. Um, it's a very good thing to start. Uh, and when you listen, you get to understand why um, safety is so important in the hospital itself. So let me move on. My daughter Josie died a year and a half ago at Johns Hopkins due to medical errors. Last week, I had the opportunity to speak at Grand Rounds to the doctors, nurses, and leadership of the hospital. I spoke about what happened to Josie and about the Josie King Patient Safety Program that is being launched. Reliving our tragedy was a painful and difficult thing for me to do. When Peter asked me two days later if I would be interested in going to Boston to speak at this conference, I quite honestly was not sure I had the strength to do it again so soon. After thinking about it, I realized I had to be here. Not only do I represent Josie, but I also represent all of the other children, the mothers, the fathers, the sisters, the brothers, the 98,000 people who die every year in this country from medical errors. I'm here for them, for their families, and for any future potential victims. I would like to share my story with you. I do this with the hope that what I'm about to tell you will make a difference in how you care for your patients and how strongly committed you and your hospital are to patient safety. Josie was 18 months old. She had brown eyes and light brown hair. She loved to dance and had just learned to bounce on the trampoline with her older siblings, Jack, Relly, and Eva. She had just learned to say, I love you. In January of 2001, Josie was admitted to Johns Hopkins after suffering first and second degree burns from climbing into a hot bath. She healed well and within weeks was scheduled for release. Two days before she was to return home, she died of severe dehydration and misused narcotics. I would like to take you through the events that resulted in this needless tragedy. Josie spent 10 days in the PQ. I was by her side every day and night. 
I paid attention to every minute detail of the doctor's and nurse's care, and I was quick to ask questions. I bonded with them and was in constant awe of the medical attention she received. Every time Josie moved or fussed, someone would be quick to push her pain button. I tried rubbing her head and found that often this would settle her. Much to our relief, Josie was experiencing a quick recovery. Her burns were healing beautifully. She was sent down to the intermediate care floor with expectations of being sent home in a few days. Her three older siblings prepared for her welcome home celebration. We were told that no one had ever been sent back up to the PQ. The following week, her central line had been taken out. I began noticing that every time she saw a drink, she would scream for it, and I thought this was strange. I was told not to let her drink. While a nurse and I gave her a bath, she sucked furiously on a washcloth. As I put her to bed, I noticed that her eyes were rolling back in her head. Although I asked the nurse to call the doctor, she reassured me that oftentimes children did this and her vitals were fine. I told her Josie had never done this and perhaps another nurse could look at her. After yet another reassurance from another nurse that everything was fine, I was told that it was okay for me to sleep at home. I called to check in two times during the night and returned to the hospital at 5.30 in the morning. I took one look at Josie and demanded that a doctor come at once. She was not fine. Josie's medical team arrived and administered two shots of Narcan. I asked if she could have something to drink. The request was approved and Josie gulped down nearly a liter of juice. Verbal orders were issued for there to be no narcotics given. As I sat with Josie, I noticed that the nurse on morning duty was acting very strangely. She seemed nervous, overly demonstrative, and in a hurry. Uneasy, I asked the other nurses about her, and they said she had been a nurse for a long time. Still worried, I expressed my concern to one of the doctors, and he agreed that she was acting a bit odd. Meanwhile, Josie started perking up. She was more alert and had kept all the liquids down. I was still scared and asked her doctors to please stay close by. At one o'clock, the nurse walked over with a syringe of methadone. Alarmed, I told her there had been an order for no narcotics. She said the orders had been changed and administered the drug. Josie's heart stopped as I was rubbing her feet. Her eyes were fixed and I screamed for help. I stood helpless as a crowd of doctors and nurses came running into her room. I was ushered into a small room with a chaplain. The next time I saw Josie, she had been moved back up to the PQ. Doctors and nurses were standing around her bed. No one seemed to want to look at me. She was hooked up to many machines and her leg was black and blue. I looked into their faces and said to them, you did this to her, now you must fix her. I was told to pray. Two days later, Jack, Relly, and Eva were brought to the hospital to kiss their beloved Josie goodbye. Josie was taken off of life support. She died in our arms on a snowy night in what's considered to be one of the best hospitals in the world. Our lives were shattered and changed forever. Josie died from severe dehydration and misused narcotics, careless human errors. On top of our overwhelming sorrow and intense grief, we were consumed by anger. They say anger can do one of two things to you. It can cause you to rot away or it can propel you forward. There were days when all I wanted was to destroy the hospital and then put an end to my own pain. My three remaining children were my only reason for getting out of bed and functioning. One day, I will tell them how they saved my life. Tony and I decided that we had to let the anger move us forward. We would do something good that would help prevent this from ever happening to a child again. It seemed the best place to start was with Johns Hopkins. Over the past year and a half, we have worked with the hospital to create the Josie King Patient Safety Program. Together we launched the program last week. 
Josie's death was not the fault of one doctor or one nurse or one misplaced decimal point. It was the result of a total breakdown in the system. It was the result of a complete lack of communication between the different teams. It was the result of doctors and nurses not listening to a concerned parent. It was the result of a combination of many errors, all of which were avoidable. What if the nurse had called the doctor when Josie's eyes were rolling back in her head? What if she could have had a drink or had been hooked up to an IV? What if the residents had paid attention and seen that her weight had dropped over 15% in 24 hours? What if the nurse had not given her the methadone? What if someone had taken my concerns seriously? What if a patient safety program had been in place? I believe that if any one of these things had occurred, the outcome could have been different and Josie would be here today. 98,000 people die every year because of medical errors. Hospital errors are among the top four leading causes of death in the country. This problem is unlike cancer, AIDS, or other diseases where we must wait for a scientific breakthrough in order to save lives. Hospitals are a man-made epidemic. Nurses and doctors make mistakes and lives are being lost. These human errors need a human solution. You are the only ones that can solve this problem, not lawyers, not insurance companies, and not people like me. Much has to be done to accomplish this. We can start by first admitting to ourselves that we are fallible. The medical community must be open to the possibility that shortcomings do exist, and you must be prepared to make the necessary changes. Please take the time to listen to a parent when they are concerned. Please learn to trust a parent's instincts. Please communicate with each other, nurses to doctors, one team to another team. Please listen to the child. Is she crying because she's in pain or is there some other reason? Please look at the child. Not all the answers are on your clipboards or computers. Thank you for listening to me today. For the past year and a half, I have known I would one day find the strength to share this story with those who can make a difference. My precious memories and everlasting love for Josie give me this strength. And I will not rest until we make something good come from her senseless death. I will not rest until hospitals become safer places. I'm not asking for your pity. I'm asking for your help. I do not know the answers. I only know that there is a problem that must be solved. Some of the best and brightest doctors and nurses in the country are in this room. And I know that together, if we are all committed and work hard, we can control hospital errors and we can save the lives of other potential victims, other helpless children. Thank you. Okay. Um, the video wasn't to, it was shown to you so that there were a couple of points that I wanted to pick up from that. And it is also one of the landmark case that allow hospitals to look at safety even much greater. And uh, this happened in 2001, so that's about 16 years ago. Um, so there's a lot we need to do. And let me just go through what they have done, and I can then share with you what I think we could learn when we try and develop policies and processes, whether it's for emergency use, for your current hospital processes, um, and, and importantly, whatever policies we create, it is really meant to ensure that patients are safe. When you have a hospital fire in the building, you come up with emergency preparedness plan. And the whole idea of that plan was to remove the patient safely and able to continue care for the patient in whatever situation that is safe. So in principle, they are all the same. And the planning works are, uh, in principle are the same. It's how much we put into it and the key things to look for, such as communication, teamwork. And it is not just a one-man plan or it's just a one person or one department's role. It is everybody's role in the hospital itself, uh, from the medical attendant who's going to pull the patient down the staircase with the, with the drape itself, 
uh, down to the nurse who's going to take care of the patient, to the doctors who's going to know what to do. So it is, it is a whole teamwork uh, rather than just an individual. Let's, let's have a look at what they did for the patient safety and then um, a hospital like John Hopkins had, has you know, objectively make a change and uh, they wanted to make this a better place and they have successfully did that. And let's see what they do. Um, so the first patient safety um, workshop that was created by John Hopkins came up with a team of people and, and, and their first tagline was that, no room for error. So whether it's a human error, technology error, process error, um, there is going to be no room for error. And it's more important in your, in your emergency plans that you have to do because it's even more critical at the emergency situation uh, and during disaster itself. So make sure when you look at planning, there isn't any error. There's no room that you could make uh, errors itself. And I know there are circumstances that you need to think about as well during this sort of planning. Um, so this is what John Hopkins has created. So let's look at some of the details. Um, even though they have rolled out the plan in same year on 2001, in June 2nd, the second tragedy happened. This lady called Ellen Roach, a patient, she's a healthy 24-year-old, died of lung failure. Um, so these are because of medication error as well. So um, the, U the U.S. human, after 10 days after her death, the U.S. Uh, Office for Human Research Protection suspended all sorts of research drugs um, that were used in that particular hospital. So it was a research drug that they were using. Um, at the end of the day, it cost another life in John Hopkins itself. So it tells you both from the research and from your, your, your regular um, work process and policy, there are a lot of ethics to think about, particularly from the research point of view. The reason why I put this case in there was while they are putting together a no room for error policy, they have a second case because they're a, they're a center to do a lot of research for new drugs, new technology, new devices. So if you're gonna use a new technology um, within your hospital and you think that's for research purpose, please make sure not only that like your emergency plan that you have, you better make sure you have a plan to deal with patients who is going to have an adverse event. Um, this morning we hear and we listen from the um, accreditation body of Thailand that adverse event is an important thing to have, uh, that, that has to be reported. Um, there are a lot of situations where um, adverse events happen as well in different um, conditions. And uh, let me also remind you that um, while utilizing new high-tech technology that has very little evidence uh, and you think you are doing research with that technology, you must have a comprehensive plan to undertake both this um, adverse event risk that would happen. And this is a case with a drug. So an example that already happened. So think about it. So not only during your disaster, you have to have a plan, but during things like this, you need to have a plan too. Um, then John Hopkins were really shattered. Um, the morale or the spirit within the hospital was so low and so bad um, they actually asked themselves, are we, do, are we going to openly address our shortcoming? That means, are we going to tell the world that we are also human, we are not perfect, we make mistakes? Are they going to do that? Or, because they are John Hopkins, is a very big name, or are we going to just cover up all the issues or all these errors under the carpet? Which means we will not tell anyone in the world and we will say it's a medical complication. That's favorite term used in the hospital that I hear a lot, medical complication. So they could do many things in the hospital to cover it up. Uh, but the question is that they, they also ask themselves, should we openly say we made mistakes? So to all planning people in the room and all policy makers in the room, um, we need to understand whether our objective is to make um, the plan work, to come up with a plan that will be successful, to ensure safety, or we should have it because we need to have one. 
So think about it. Okay, so this is John Hopkins. So what did they do? I'm just rolling through the process and I'll share with you how it relates. Um, 200 different tasks were changed um, within the hospital itself to deal with patients. Um, you know, the leadership, again, and I think from this morning till now, most of the speaker has been mentioning about leadership. It has to begin with the leadership. The leadership told the frontline counters, this is my mobile phone. If, if there is people, doctors, nurses, assistants, whoever that is in the hospital that, that does not adhere to the new policies to ensure there is safety, you call me at 2 a.m. in the morning, I will pick up the phone. So the leadership influence to the team and the whole hospital is very important. And how it has been carried out by the team has to begin with the insistence and the dream or the objective of the leadership itself. Um, so this, this is what Don Hopkins pushed in the, in the early stage, right? So they also look at not just the process changes, but they also look at people's competency. So we can prepare a lot of different plans and, and, and emergency-related preparedness. Um, there is no good if we don't train, and my colleague Jim has also mentioned about practice, practice, practice. And I think we need to make sure that no matter how busy we are, no matter how underfunding we are, we need to ensure we allocate certain resources to make sure that what you wrote on the paper, the policy process and protocol that is fantastic that you wrote on the piece of paper can be carried out. And people has the ability, competency, knowledge and skills to actually carry them out. So same goes to this patient safety initiative that they have in John Hopkins. They put in enough resources to ensure people competency improves. Okay. Now, next line that they did was the most difficult because why in the past and in many countries, um, clinical team are superior. Management in the, in the hospital comprises primarily with clinical um, experts are superior among all. But again, safety has no hierarchy. It is not just safety for the top management or the best surgeon or the best nurses, but it is also the safety of the best staff in the ward, in the clinic, in the department itself. Safety does not distinguish whether you are on top or you are at the bottom. You have to look at it as a whole. If you agree that you look at it as a whole, then you have to embrace what you agree, not just on the piece of paper, but you have to do it. And you have to show that people are able to do that as well. That is the only way from the leadership down that you ensure safety can be carried out is to encourage every single one of them to practice safety. Rebuild the, the culture and the approach of how you deal with and how you look with uh, on safety itself. So the culture of safety is very important. Um, so what they did was that they created a comprehensive unit-based safety program in John Hopkins to deal with this whole process of changing people's mindset from bottom to top or top to bottom to ensure that safety is being carried out and so that everybody embrace safety within their own scope of work, right? Um, checklists were implemented such as in, in a, you know, been carried out and, and in the US, many people or many ICUs has adopted what they have actually been created as well. And uh, um, one of the reports states that, you know, um, such an approach following what John Hopkins has improved on has actually um, reduced bloodstream infection by 40% and saved 500 lives worth about 34 million in total in terms of uh, cost of medication uh, in what they have done. So improving patient safety was not a choice for John Hopkins. It's not like I, I want to do it because I want accreditation. I want to do it because it will help me have a name that I have a patient safety um, organization within my hospital itself. They didn't do it because of that. 
They did it because it is an obligation because every patient who comes into your hospital is going to say that I am safe now in your hospital. But what is safety in your hospital? Patient won't understand. Only people within the hospital itself would understand how safety should be done, how safety should be provided to a patient itself. So they, they believe it is, not what they, it is not a choice that they can choose. It is a must. It is an obligation that they have to provide for every single patient and staff that is within John Hopkins itself. So they started to look at um, the important factor, which is the mind, the mind of every single people in the hospital, the feeling, taking away some people's ego, putting in the mindset of only one thing, safety as the key objective. So they have certain initiative being carried out. Safety culture must be implemented in every hospital if you want your hospital to be safer. Um, behavioral and attitude of people is the one that you have to change. Whether whichever level that we are within the hospital itself, whether I am an um, attendant in a ward or at a clinic, or I am a CEO of a hospital, we need to embrace and change uh, our behavior and our mindset and our attitude towards how safety is being carried out in the hospital itself. It is essential to look at the foundation. This is an important foundation where you start to ensure every single team member in the hospital itself think about their work, think about every step of their work uh, from the safety point of view. How, when I'm going to do this, is there a risk to the patient or not? If I am late, what will happen to the patient? If I do not listen to the mother or the, fam the patient's family, just like Josie King's mother, uh, what would have happened? If, she, if the nurse or the doctor would have listened to the mother, or if they would have taken better communication approach among the team member. Um, in Josie King's case, the biggest error was because there were shift change. The record of the, uh, the um, uh, uh, treatment protocol to the particular patient was not proper. Communication from one shift to another was not proper. Henceforth, they caused a lot of all these things. Simple thing, communication. And a lot of you within this room will say, ah, communication is very easy. It's something we do every day. I am expert in doing it. I mean, I see a lot of experts and everyone tells me they're expert in doing a lot of things, but I still see a lot of error. And if we are expert, we are zero error. We are, you know, we're only human, right? So we cannot be zero error. So if we cannot be zero error, we must constantly remind ourselves in the square work that we do, our, our job scope that we have, to ensure that there is an element of safety and that's how the culture has to be developed within everyone itself. Um, in an organization who practice safety culture, who has a real patient safety culture within the organization, um, allows people to actually speak up. It allows people to point out areas that needs improvement. The word um, nook and canny means every single person. Every single level of people has the ability to speak up and point out what is important to improve um, with the objective of safety. They're not speaking out because of fun, but with the objective of safety. It should be encouraged within the entire organization of the hospital to have the ability to speak up with the objective of having a better safety outcome for patient, okay? And in terms of safety culture, it is not just one person's responsibility, it is every single person within the hospital itself. I'm, I'm sure some of you may have um, come across this particular article before. Human is to R. It is one of the landmark article that changes the American healthcare in the eyes of safety. There were, in, there were so many um, incidents, medical reported incidents in, at that point of time um, that this article came out. And patients 
uh, or people are worried going into a hospital because they don't know if they would come out alive. So, so it is something that created the opportunity to develop patient safety um, as a culture in the hospital. So patient safety, I must remind you that it is not something you can choose to do. It is not because we do it for accreditation. It is not because we're doing it for marketing purpose, but it is not, it is a choice, or it is not a choice, it is an obligation that we need to deliver. So if you have a chance, please look out for this in, uh, report and you will be able to read this article and understand how it works and what happened. So at the end of the day, our goal to ensure safety is really to make sure that um, our, fr our people, who, friends who work in the hospital, which is the staff, and uh, importantly, the people who trusted us, as in working in the hospital, the patients themselves, when they trust us so much and they walk into our hospital for treatment, we have to ensure that um, their trust uh, worth being trusted in this hospital, we will provide the amount of safety for them. So to move things a bit further, um, or before I move into that part, um, so I wanted to talk about safety because I think patient safety and emergency preparedness or disasters that you have uh, and how you treat disaster management um, has direct, in, direct impact and influence. If you don't have a policy and protocol to deal with your day-to-day -day, uh, safety of your patients within the hospital, then how would you be so wonderfully preparing an emergency preparedness plan? And how would an emergency preparedness plan be carried out? If, you have to, if, you, if we can assess ourselves today as to how we carried out our day-to-day -day operations, then we can assess ourselves and be confident that the emergency plans that we prepare um, could also be fantastic. Um, so I speak about real life examples and facts that have already been happened. It's not an, it's not an illustration or a, it's not a um, 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 story anymore. So when I look at safety, I look at the hospital as this quadrant itself. Within the hospital, we have the facility, we have the people, and we have the technology. And ho this whole place is balanced up by the people process and the use of technology that you have within the hospital itself. Because it's a 40 minutes presentation or an hour presentation, I'm only going to be able to focus on one area. So I'm going to look at the technology as a key perspective. So let's review what we know about technology and let's be honest to ourselves what we think about technology. Not all devices are created equal. Not all ventilators are the same, not all MRIs are the same, not all diatomy machines are the same, not all drugs are the same. So we need to understand and know which one is suitable for your healthcare environment. So you need to understand, not because I, feel, I think I know, we need to adopt this not because we feel it is correct, you've got to have enough facts because every single thing we talk about in terms of technology has direct impact on the patient. And remember, we talk about safety. Remember, we talk about our responsibility in our work to ensure safety culture is there within the hospital. And remember, we talk about, you know, hospital being safe. And if that is the objective and if you agree, then we need to make sure that technology considerations becomes evidence-based too. With that, then you can safely say that your hospitals are offering evidence-based medicine because technology is part, part of the medicine that you are offering to a patient itself. So look at that in that context and, uh, and bear in mind that really not all devices are going to be the same. Things that is moving forward in technology such as intraoperability, the demand for intraoperability like you know hybrid OR, things like that are getting very highly demanded because it's, it's sexy, some people say, it's nice and it's fantastic, it does a very good job for the patient. I do not dispute and I do not disagree. 
what I'm saying is we need to understand what we are getting into the hospital as a technology, how we can manage them, how we can ensure risk of those technology has been actually written down and we understood what we need to do in order to ensure the type of technology we brought in are able to provide safety for the patient itself. Innovative disruptive device. My favourite topic and a lot of people would have heard me say this already. Robotic surgery. So I'm not going to go into the details of that. And, and new other technologies, maybe the new ones that is going to come and I think people will want to buy is the uh, MRI that comes with radiotherapy. So you can do MRI scanning and provide radiotherapy at the same time. And I would think, you know, in near future, every single hospital who deals with oncology is going to be like rushing to buy the technology itself. So my question to you, how do you know it works? Next thing is about genomic. Many people talk about um, DNA or sequencing um, of your blood and trying to find a predictive um, output for a chance of having a cancer or CA or something like that. How do we know that this test is accurate? Based on what? Based on what the company says? Based on uh, their processes and marketing papers that they have? How do you know? Because genomic sequencing, the two key parts are the biomarkers. Biomarkers are public domain. Everyone will know the biomarkers. The only thing that you and I won't know is the algorithm. Every single company would have a different algorithm in sequencing and making that prediction. And that is a patent of the company. So if we cannot know the algorithm and we cannot know whether it's accurate or not, how do you pay so much money to do that test? So information is very important to find out. So those are those new disruptive tests that's going to happen and a lot of impact to social as well. Um, innovation techniques, some people learn about doing a treatment or a procedure new. For example, someone was just asking me this morning, um, there was this technology or this treatment to use cold therapy to freeze tumours. It's a technique, it's a new way, a new device, new technique. How do we know it works? Have you tested it? Is there enough evidence to say it works? But it's new, I want to do it. I want to, make, I want to be the first to do it. I think Jack Ma, if you know Alibaba, Jack Ma says, you cannot be good in, good in doing everything. He says, but you must be the first in doing everything. So I think to myself, yes, maybe in business and, 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 and commercial world, yes, we should. But in healthcare, you're talking about another person's life. It may not be your friend, but it may be your friend's friend. It may not be your family, but it may be your family member's friend. So it's another life. Healthcare is a little bit different, right? I'm not being very um, negative about things, but I'm just, tell I'm just trying to give you the sense of having risks in your mind when you think about everything in terms of technology. Integration of technology in the healthcare setting. This is the next topic, big one that is coming along the wave. Everybody want to hook up their eye infusion pump, their monitors, their laboratory, their pharmacy into the electronic medical record. And you have seen many presenters this morning has talked about cyber security and ransomware. The impact to Asia, you don't feel it yet because the regulation is not uh, strong and being enforced. But if, the, if you look at what the American has done, which is fantastic, they have a HIPAA and high-tech rule, law. And that will ensure every single hospital member and people who has data or transact data or has the ability to, to have a touch on the data will be penalized or punished if it is not being properly managed. And it will soon come to this part of the world because of this cybersecurity thing. So before you integrate everything in your hospital itself in terms of the technology, uh, please have more consideration, real good planning process, 
um, again, run through the details of things from the front line, not from what you think from the middle or from the top, but from the, from the very first step that a patient steps into the door of your hospital. You should start the consideration from there until he moves out and go home safely. So, so that's one of those things. And the last but not least, of course, then the new things that is in technology is everybody is asking me, Eric, what is a smart hospital? I want to build a smart hospital. I say you watch too much of Star Wars and Star Trek. You want to build smart hospital. What is a smart hospital? Oh, I want a screen that is like, you know, Iron Man, you zoom up and it's an invisible screen. I can see the patient's data and all that. What does that mean for the patient? Does it help the patient to heal faster? Is it cheaper for the patient? You know, what, is the, what, what kind of technology is that? What does it do for a patient? Or is it just for doctor to feel good? Or is it just for hospital to say that I have an invisible screen? Why? So what is a smart hospital? Give it a deep thought or the principle. And in my principle of a smart hospital, it has to go back to basics. It has to be safe, it has to be efficient, and it has to be effective, both for the patient and for the hospital staff. So let's move on. Um, my colleague has talked about the top 10. I'm just going to show you a little bit about hazards that we publish every year. Some of you may already have seen some of our hazard publication on the year, uh, year on, and, 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 and we have a lot of all those publications about technology problems. Uh, just, this is just a, a, a slide showing you the 2017 hazard itself. Every year we will rank 10 of them, and you will see from devices, from user to software, they're all there. They're all at the, at, at inside our top 10 hazard list. So it is there so that you could understand the importance of having more attention in terms of how you deal with technology itself to ensure safety. So one of the things to talk about or a concept that was created, and this, this theory was, has been around for a long time, and, um, but this is that not been really properly adopted uh, by hospitals and across the world. Um, and, and health technology management is something that you may want to consider um, adopting as a, as a principle or a concept to your hospital, how you manage the technology. So it talks about um, healthcare services that, that are technology driven. Um, it talks about we need this because it's getting more complex within my hospital itself. Um, hospital management needs to look at uh, how to make sure our technology are constantly delivering a, a safe and consistent output. Um, how, does it, how do we make sure that we have enough technology to treat the constant flow of patient that comes in, the, the amount of patient that has been increasingly coming into our hospital? How do we manage that? When do we increase the amount of technology when we should not? And what, what are the things that we should increase uh, in terms of technology and what we should be? And again, the key principle of HTM or health technology management is about safety, efficiency, and cost effectiveness as well. So this is a chart that was um, being de developed by WHO quite a while ago. And I, I was surprised it was already there, but nobody really started to think about it. And HTM is where I think you should understand within the red box itself what is on top is how a company creates a product. And what is, what is within the square box is what you have to do in the hospital to look at managing the technology. So this is a nutshell chart. You can just look at this and you would understand the steps that you need to do. So how do we look at safety when well, we have talked about technology so how do we look at safety in more detail and my topic is diving deep right so so we're going to go a little bit deeper so we talk about technology and how it has impact on safety how it impacts your policy your plan your processes and everything now the next thing i want to talk about is how is safety being managed by people particularly related with technology itself 
This is a simple chart, and usually when I do training, this is, this is there. Uh, this time round, I won't ask you to tell me where the problem is. Um, there is four mistakes in the photograph. I wonder if you can find where the error is within this photograph. Okay. Um, there are some engineers who will know because it's quite technical in the photo, right? But there's a lot of other um, people in the room may find this questionable. What's wrong with this photo, right? So let me, I mean, okay, I'll share with you some of the things. You shouldn't hold a soldering iron when it's hot on the metal. It's wrong. You cannot wear color glasses when you're doing work because it will disturb, it disturb, disturb the, the, the color vision of the person and things like that. There's a fall error on their part. But the moral what I wanted to drive in is this. We must always understand that we do not know what we do not know. It is, it is, it is very difficult, and this is some, one of the things, if you could change and have this in the, um, uh, as part of your patient safety culture policy, then it will be excellent. We need to understand things like we do not know what we don't know, and which is the truth, right? So think about it. So this is a human factor. So what does US FDA say about human factor, particularly related to technology itself? Knowledge about human capabilities in definition, knowledge about human capabilities and limitation to design and development. The characteristic of the user these are the areas that they consider within the human factor under US FDA's definition, right? Um, Mr. Decker, who is an author, I refer to his, his book that he's written, and I think this is a very good book that you, should, you guys should actually get hold of. The link is down there. Um, his definition about human factor and adverse event is, I just think he's just a brilliant guy who spells out things that we, some of people who not want to say about and uh, some of the areas like the point, the point is not to protect it from unreliable people. We should, which means we should not change the process and the technology just to protect unreliable people. This is what he says in his book. Okay, hospital itself, and we must all recognize. Okay, and this is what he says, and I quote, um, contains inherent lack of safety. And we have to begin to understand that our hospital started with lack of safety in the beginning. Why? Why? Um, to go into that detail, I have to sit down and talk about that in a little bit longer, which I'm not going to dwell in, but please read this book. There is a lot of um, good points that he has brought it up, and you should, you should actually understand it more. So human error is systematically connected to the feature of people's tools, tasks, operating environment. Process on safety comes from understanding and influencing these connections. So this is what he has said as well. And I'll bring you to this chart. Some of the case in accident investigation that our colleagues has done before uh, in the United States particularly, let's use example of surgical fire that Jim has brought up as well. Um, it comes with this thing. Is it, is it our mind, our brain problem? Human error happen because our brain tells us to do something. Whether it's consciously or is it's subconsciously, it is our mind. So we need to understand things such as perception of that particular person, the motor response that they have. Once you receive a perception, there will be a response, right? But before you respond, you will connect to your memory database within your head and understand what you, know, what you already know before. Use those as the reasoning and then respond with an action. So in, in this theory of NISER basically tells you that what a staff in the hospital do will be influenced by what they know how they were taught to reason it out, and what is shown to them every day. 
makes the final reaction of what they do. So consider this when you are looking at an incident or an accident or a, a issue um, uh, with human factor. Um, within the hospital itself, human factor has to be looked at, uh, you know, based on these two charts. And uh, this was created by our colleague Mark Broly. And uh, this, this chart and the following chart will be a very simplified way for you to really consider human factor influencing safety, particularly with, with technology and environment. So you have the device in the middle, the inter interface between the hospital environment, the user, the accessories, and the patient itself. The next one is the patient interface, which is interaction, which is what we are more concerned about as well. How did the patient inter interact with the user of the technology? What kind of technology was given to the patient? What was the facility and environment that is given or to the patient during his or her care in your facility itself? And what were the type of technology and was it safe uh, enough for the patient itself? Consider this uh, two charts when you look at um, safety itself as a whole and when you're thinking about areas where safety can happen. So consider this chart itself. So if you understand that you know, we have to be safe in, in, and provide safe patient safety for our patients in the hospital, um, then you've got to start thinking about risk. Begin with looking at what could happen, what may happen, and uh, what can we do to prevent this from happening. So perception of the risk, um, assessing them, and look at how we can manage those risks that is associated to, to, to the hospital itself. So one of the ways to do is to establish a, a enterprise risk management program. It is a program, it is a very difficult job. A lot of risk management colleagues in, uh, in, in other countries' hospitals, um, I, I was in Singapore and they were telling me that nobody appreciates what they do. Risk management is it's not, nobody is happy with risk management in the hospital because nobody appreciates what they do. Uh, but I can say this, if the risk managers or the risk management are not there to help you prevent accident or incident from happening and make your job and your life so smoothly in the hospital, you will be chaotic. You will have chaos in your hospital. So thinking about risk to begin with is not just for some people to be happy. It is, to, it is a step, a very important step to ensure you are taking patient safety really seriously. So there are no right ways to do risk management. Um, the goal is to really achieve um, um, a better organization decision making process, um, align team members with the um, uh, organization's risk appetite, how much, I'm, how much risk I'm willing to take, uh, assist the board and uh, corporate governance to ensure that your hospital has a protocol in risk to, to help mitigate and reduce and improve your patient safety standards itself. Incorporate risk management into your decision-making process. Every single decision-making process before you write it into the protocol or SOP, uh, think about the risk and every technology you use every process that you decide. Now I want to have less one nurse in this ward. I want to reduce my head count here to reduce costs. I want to reduce this to reduce costs. I want to, bring, I want to spend more money in the new technology so that I can put it in my marketing brochure so that patients can come to my hospital more. All this is decision making that you have to do within the hospital itself and it's part of risk and think about it and consider the risk of everything that we decide, like what in emergency preparedness as well. Um, if we decide to um, put the biomedical engineer department, uh, department in the basement itself, um, then think about that risk. If you decide to put your oxygen tank, pure oxygen tank, that links to your entire hospital oxygen network, uh, if you put it in the basement itself, think about that risk when you have a flood. You literally have to evacuate the entire hospital itself because there's no oxygen to be provided, right? So things like that other than the other things. So, so reduce your risk exposure. Um, this is just a quick chart that you can have a look at. Um, it's a framework that 
you could find uh, in our agri's publications as well some of our publication talks about risk management and this is a very nice framework that you can start thinking about um, it will help you come up with a process for you to make decision so risk management is the greatest tool to ensure that your hospital becomes safer if you apply more risk management into your hospital you ensure you will use this in your quality assurance anyway you will use this in a lot of your clinical decisions anyway so why not apply risk management into all uh, areas whether it's clinical or non-clinical itself right now we encourage and I think this morning is also been mentioned about patient safety reporting system so patient safety reporting system I would use the Western country, particularly the United States, as an example. We are able to share with you so many cases because the American people are very open to say that I am wrong. I make mistake. They are very open to come out and say that I want to learn to and correct the mistake that I do. That is why they publish the cases. That is why they make those information, some, if I, would, if I may, are shameful information public because people could learn. But in Asia, and I'm an Asian, it is sad that we always put all this information under the carpet. We never learn from our own mistakes. We, should, we tell our children, you fall down, never mind, you come out and try again. You fall down, you learn from what you make in the mistakes, and you become better. But we never practice that in our real world when, we're doing, when we do work, particularly with work that we have to deal with other people's life. So think about it. So another recommendation you could think about, particularly with policies itself, especially with reporting system, is about in the past, or currently, not in the past, currently, there are specific people who would make reports on incident and accident. There is a process to specific people making a report. Um, I want you to think about utilizing different things such as technology. I want you to think about WikiLeaks. I want you to think about Twitter. I want you to think about Facebook. Who should report versus who can report an incident? That will help to have more data and incident report so that it can be synthesized and analyzed so that a proper um, lesson learned can be shared with everybody to reduce the risk. So if you're going to develop a policies within your organization itself, consider this. It is not a, it is not a guideline, but it's a, it's a recommendation that you may want to think about it. Who can report versus who could report? So think about it, right? Um, one of an example of reporting system that has really helped people to make their hospitals safer, this is a real life example that's been published in May 2017. Um, they integrated risk management with patient safety. Um, they conducted a you know organization wide culture safety um, program to ensure everybody thinks about safety, safety, safety. And um, you know they get about one thousand reports a month, including near miss, not only incident. They get about thousand report a month. Okay, um, risk management work closely with clinicians work closely with all the different other departments to ensure that you know, potential risks are being considered uh, and there's a thorough disclosure, right? So what was the outcome of what they did? And this is a real case, yeah? the hospital actually practiced that. 50% drop in malpractice, 5-0. 50% drop in malpractice cases. 62% drop in professional liability premium claims. This was the report when they carry out what they did. 
And when people say that when we do risk and we ensure safety, we do what we can to ensure safety itself, but it actually has other impacts that if you think about it. Um, so this is an example with that. So to ensure safety and you're going very deep into safety, then it is actually a very long journey. Um, it is a rough Herculean journey. It's like Hercules going through that journey in the movie, fighting monsters and whatever not. It's tough. Um, you will face oppositions. There will be people in the hospital itself that is going to say, no, I'm not going to change. You want to have patient safety, you can have the policy on the paper. Don't make me change. But I will agree, you write it on the paper to get your accreditation and all that. You will get oppositions that comes like that. You will have clinical teams, which I emphasize, and this is the truth. There will be clinical team members who will not like this change and who will not like to reduce well, in theory, they like to reduce risk, but you know, when you tell them to do it in real life, it's easier to tell them to, to work. And, and, and it's, really, it's really hard, and I, I personally also have tried that before. It's very hard to make clinical people uh, agree. Um, then you have people, particularly oppositions, who's gonna question your data. Oh, how accurate is your data? Are you sure our risk is so high? Blah, blah, blah. But if you don't start collecting data and you don't begin with the first step and it's not, it's not going to be perfect when you start it, uh, how are you going to move forward with the correct information and data itself? And more importantly, I hear from many of the hospitals as I travel around the region in Asia Pacific, um, no time. Hospital has no money for me to do this. I have not enough people to help me take care of this, how to do survey, how to measure. So this has been the biggest challenge that they talk about. Now let me, you know, Acri did a survey report and I wanted to uh, show you this and then with this I will try to wrap up already. Um, you, you can go through the slides and it could be downloaded from the um, um, website later as well. So these are the most common barrier um, in the survey response uh, in the survey response that we get when we, when they are trying to do um, all this work itself. So you can have a look at that. Um, in summary, risk management tool is important to use if you want to really go into safety very deeply. Um, implementation method, how you implement the method and the process is very important. Um, it is okay, it is not perfect at the first time, but if you don't try, you will never make it perfect. You should try. Culture of safety is needed. It has to come from the number one person on top of the organization. So leadership support is a must. Acceptance from the um, common goal, you know, one of the ways that we try and tell everybody is that it is not about you, it is not about me. It is about the patient who comes to our hospital. It is about the patient who trusted us. Um, sorry I dragged the time a little bit longer, but with that, thank you very much, Kakun Kap.